This is a very unique program today on the Manifest Telecast, and I'm going to be doing numerous word studies. One of my favorite things to do as far as when I teach or preach a message, exposing a dark revelation. So let's get started with this. When it comes to battles that we have in our life, including spiritual battles, there were actually three uh, continual battles that we're dealing with in life. Number one is the battle between truth and lies. The Bible said this in John chapter 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And you know, that Greek word know can also allude to not just knowing in your head or knowing by seeing something. It can allude to having an experience with someone and actually knowing them. So when you know the truth, it's to have an experience with Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. When it comes to the battle of truth versus lies, there is so much false information, misleading information, and misinformation that is being propagated not only uh, in parts of the body of Christ, but in the secular media. In the ministry of Jesus, I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about the four lies that were told on him by religious people. Number one, they said that he worked through Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That was a lie. They said that he said that it he that he could destroy that temple in Jerusalem in three days and build it back up. That was misinformation. He was talking about dying, his physical body being raised from the dead. Number three, they kept saying he was breaking the law. He was not. He was breaking the traditions of the elders, but he never broke the law of the Father. Number four, they said that his disciples stole the body. You know, that, that was another lie. He resurrected from the dead. The disciples did not steal the body. Jesus, throughout his ministry, had to battle people who were continually lying. And the biggest thing is it wasn't sinners. It was religious people. Think about that and meditate on that for a while. Now, here's the second thing that I want to tell you. There is a battle between bitterness and forgiveness. Now, I have watched people in my lifetime weaponize unforgiveness and use their unforgiveness as, spir as a spiritual tool and spiritual weapon to attack someone that they hate, they dislike, they're an enemy with, or they disagree with. This also happened in the ministry of Jesus, where he had to deal with people who were uh, angry and bitter because they disagreed with his style, his ministry, what he was teaching, etc. Number three, there is a real battle going on and it's massive between spiritual deception and spiritual delusion. Delusional people and deceptive people. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells you that at the time of the end, near the time of the revealing of the Antichrist, that God will send people a strong delusion. Now, when God sends it, it means he permits a delusion that they would believe a lie and be condemned because they do not love the truth. In Greek, uh, uh, something that is delusional or someone that's deceptive means an imposter, a misleader, a rover, someone who's leading other people astray. So, in a delusion, what happens is people often live in a fantasy world and they make up their own fantasies and they mix it with their ideas, their thoughts, things they hear. And so it becomes a fantasy. They speak it, then it becomes a complete delusion and uh, they become deceived. And the word deceived means living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. Uh, for example, in Titus 3 and 3. Paul said in 2 Th uh, Timothy chapter uh, uh um, I think it's chapter four, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I think that's 2 Timothy 3, 13. But the word seducer is an imposter and someone muttering spells. So we've got all these scriptures to beware of deception and delusional people in the time of the end. There's a word in the King James translation of the Bible in, this, in the passage that talks about 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, the people that and act or act in certain ways in their life that cannot enter the kingdom. And one of those words is a really strange word called a reviler. A person who is a reviler cannot enter the kingdom. Now, I want you to remember something. This passage of 1 Corinthians 6 was addressed to a carnal church called the church at Corinth that had all sorts of immorality going on in it. So a reviler could not enter the kingdom. A reviler in Greek, listen to this, is someone who is abusive with their words, someone who slanders other people, and someone who tries to bring a reproach against someone. 
and they do it through their words. So a reviler cannot enter the kingdom. So ladies and gentlemen, these are the things we talk about spiritual battle, spiritual warfare, fighting spirits, fighting demonic powers, but these are the type of things that we're dealing with. Most of your problem is a principality, that's a strong devil, working through a personality. Demonic powers work through people. So our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not necessarily against that person, but against, it's against the spirit that is motivating that person to do or say or act in a way that they're acting or saying. Now, the director of the dark kingdom, the dark kingdom, I don't know if you can see that ugly image right there, is someone who was a fallen angel, one of the chief fallen angels, it is believed by many scholars there were three chief angels, Michael the archangel, Gabriel, and also this one that was called Lucifer or Satan. And uh, that word Lucifer is a bright star, a morning star. So he was part of the original three and uh, later became known as Satan. Now in the Old Testament, we find the word Satan that is used. Now it is used in two ways. It is used, first of all, in the English translation to identify Satan, the fallen angel, the person of Satan. But it's also used uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Like if you were reading the Bible in Hebrew, the word Satan is used for the word adversary. And one of the um, unique places where this is found is in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 14, verse 23 and verse 25, where it talks about King Solomon and it says that God rose up an adversary against Solomon. In Hebrew, it reads, and God rose up a Satan against Solomon. So uh, someone who is an adversary working against someone who is trying to do the will of God can become a Satan, not Satan the person, but can become Satan or Satan, which actually means an adversary. In the Old Testament, there are three references I want to give you where Satan the person, Satan the fallen angel appears in the Bible. The first is Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. The Yeshua the high priest is at the temple near the altar and the Bible says Satan came to standing on the right side of the altar to resist him. So in this passage, Satan, the fallen angel, is falsely accusing the high priest of having filthy garments, hoping to make him unfit in the eyes of God to minister at the temple. The second example, which is very well known, is Job chapters 1 and chapter 2, where Satan appears in those chapters again, but this time in the throne room of God area, the area of the throne room with all the different angels of God, and he's coming as a prosecutor to make a case against a righteous man named Job. And we know the story there in the 42 chapters of Job. Now, the third example that I want to give you is 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1. It says that Satan rose up to provoke King David to number Israel. Now, numbering Israel was a normal thing. There's a whole book of numbers that deals with the numbers of Israel war soldiers that were in the nation of Israel. However, you had to pay, each man was required to pay, according to the Torah, a half shekel for the price of redemption every time a census was conducted, and that half shekel would go to repairs of the tabernacle. Well, David did not collect the half shekel, so in reality, it was as though he was saying, redemption has no price, and 70,000 men were slain in a judgment as a result of David's disobedience. So uh, Satan rose up to provoke David to number Israel. And I always wondered why in that setting was Satan angry at David? What provoked Satan to provoke David? And if you go to the chapter before that, you will discover that David's mighty men wiped out the remaining four giants that were in the land. Now in David's teenage days, there was Goliath, Ishbibinoth, Saph, Lami, Goliath's brother, and a giant from Gath with six fingers on each hand, six toes on each feet. These were very large men that literally harassed and intimidated the Israelites. David's men killed the last of the giants, which were the seed of the serpent alluded to by God in the garden in Genesis 3.15. He predicted there would be a battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We don't have time to get into that. But in reality, here's what I want to tell you. 
that when the giants that were very successful uh, all the way back in the days of Noah in distracting mankind, when, though, when they were slain, Satan's seed that he had used for generations was wiped out and then he provoked David, the giant killer, to number Israel. So basically, here's what I want to tell you, that in the Old Testament, Satan is seen as the accuser, the deceiver, and the adversary against those who are righteous. The name Satan uh, appears 35 times out of 34 verses, and in each case, uh, you know, especially when we come into the New Testament, in each case where the name appears, it is referring to the fallen angel Satan. Matthew 4, verse 3, he appeared to be the tempter in the time when Jesus was tempted in the Judean wilderness. And then we read, um, when, we, when we do a word study on the, the name Satan, it is the Greek word uh, diabolos. And uh, diabolos actually refers to um, someone who was a false accuser or a slanderer. And it comes out of two Greek words that mean through and to throw or to throw through. Uh, I heard a man explain at this time, it is like taking a metal ball and hitting it against a ship in the Greek time or the Roman time until it would crack the boards or it would, it would break the ship in, in, in a certain area where that metal ball was hitting. It means to continually throw darts at, continually throw spears and arrows at. Remember the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that there are fiery darts of the enemy and the shield of faith is required to quench the fire that's in those fiery darts, okay? That's the example of throwing something through, thrusting darts, thrusting mental darts, thrusting mental arrows. And an arrow, there, you know, there's different kinds of arrows that were in the Roman time. One arrow was just a normal arrow with the metal tip. But there were also arrows that were set on fire when they hit the, uh, a leather shield. It would set the shield on fire. A fiery dart is not a normal thought. It is a thought that continually burns in your mind. It's something that you can't get out of your head. Uh, it can be a testing or a temptation or a thought that continually is in your head. I had somebody write me one time and said, I'm continually, just continually having suicidal thoughts. Now, that is a fiery dart of the enemy. That's not normal. So sometimes it can be a side effect of certain med medicine that people take. We know that. You can see that on commercials on television. But we also know that uh, suicidal thoughts can be because of things that have happened causing depression or it could be the pressure of some type of a tormenting spirit. And that has to be dealt with spiritually. It can't, that, a tormenting spirit can't be uh, dealt with through a medical doctor. That has to be dealt with through prayer fasting or by being prayed for the way Jesus and the apostles did in the New Testament by people who are troubled by different kinds of spirits. Now, having said that, let me continue to say something to you that in the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, and I really want to try to focus quite a bit on what I'm about to tell you right here because when we talk about the devil, I mean, when I grew up, I remember this. I remember this teaching and, and you know, we back then... Um, we would say, every devil that's in hell, you know, preachers would get to preaching and they'd wax elo eloquent. Every devil in hell. Well, in reality, there are fallen angels that are bound in Tartarus, which is the lowest part of hell, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. And Satan, in the book of Job, God asked him, where have you been? And he said, going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it, up and down in the earth. So he has access to the chambers that are underneath the earth. Hell is underneath the earth. So the departed souls of men and women who died lost without covenant or they were wicked, they're in the lower chambers of the earth and there are compartments under the earth. I'm, I'm really getting sidetracked here, but I want to share this with you. And in Luke 16, before the crucifixion of Jesus, the righteous went into the lower parts of the earth and there was a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise but way below that in the lower parts is the area of hell or Tartarus or the chambers of fallen angels. But demonic powers that we know of in Ephesians chapter 6 are working in the atmosphere of the cosmos and also working in the upper atmosphere of the heavens and working on earth. So this is who we battle against Ephesians chapter 6 are those demonic powers that are now working on the earth. In Revelation 12 verse 10, however, there's a verse that says this, and this is very important you hear this. 
Satan is the accuser of the brethren before God day and night. Now, when we, when we think about this, how does Satan accuse the brethren? First of all, I want to point this out, that it does not say Satan is the accuser of the sinner before God day and night, because Satan already has a sinner. A person that is unrepentant or unredeemed is someone that the enemy already has their soul and spirit in, in, uh, destined for hell. Now, that, I'm not talking now predestination here, but I'm talking about if they are presently in sin and not repentant and not serving the Lord, he already has them. But once a person becomes a believer, what does the enemy do? He wants to approach God to accuse you of a failure or a sin in hopes that that, that that judgment will be passed and your name will be removed from the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, I do know there's entire theologies that believe that never happens, but you've not read all of your Bible because the Bible talks about names being blotted out in the Old Testament, names being blotted out in the New Testament. But my point is that Satan wants to accuse you before God. He did it to Job. Now, he didn't accuse Job of sin, but, it, but he accused Job of serving God for the wrong motive. And he said to God, if you will test him, I will show you he will curse you. Now, there have been ministers of the gospel that I am totally convinced. And some of these people I know personally, some of these men and women of God have been friends of mine for many years. I have watched men and women of God in my lifetime go through horrendous battles. Some of them were self-inflicted. However, some of them were caused by people that they knew that had turned on them. Uh, sometimes they were caused by ex-staff members. Sometimes they were caused by family members and just slander and accusations and at times lies that they had to deal with. And I looked at that and I realized that what Satan was trying to do in the life of these particular individuals that I'm speaking of was hoping that they would just quit, hoping that they would give up. I mean, I've heard ministers that have been through serious battles, say to me, I don't even know if this is worth it. Is it really worth putting my family or myself through all the craziness you have to go through? I could go get a high paying job and not have to deal with most of this mess that's coming against me. Well, you may be able to do that, but the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, meaning that if God truly calls a person to preach, he does not revoke that call because they're going through something. He doesn't even revoke it if they sin because if they repent, just like David, the call of kingship remained on him. And that's the grace and the mercy of God only. But I want you to understand the secret that Satan doesn't want you to understand. There is a secret he does not want to expose. And that secret is that he is the accuser of the brethren before God day and night, and he uses, now watch this carefully, people on earth to do his work. See, if, if Satan is accusing us in heaven, we may know nothing about that. We may never see that with our eyes. If he's accusing you in heaven before God, uh, no one on earth may, may even know that. However, if people on earth are, are repeating the accusations, accusations, I should say, that Satan is saying to God, then they are becoming the voice of Satan on earth, just like there is a literal Satan in heaven. And so this is, this is the secret he does not want you to know. Beloved, I write unto you that you sin not, but if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says this, who is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the secret. The reason that the enemy wants you to feel accusation and feel failure is because according to the Bible, it produces condemnation. Condemnation is a feeling and a sense of guilt and unworthiness. When you are under condemnation, you do not feel worthy. When you're under condemnation, you feel guilt. Now, how does that affect you? Here's what John wrote. He wrote about that if we are feel condemnation, we have no confidence that God is even hearing our prayers. When you feel condemned, you can't worship in church. When you feel condemnation, you're praying and the devil says, God's not hearing your prayer. God's not hearing a thing you've got to say. You know how you are, blah, 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 blah. 
And so condemnation impacts your confidence that God is with you, that God is still in you, that God has not forsaken you, or that God is hearing your prayers. So it is important, ladies and gentlemen, that you deal with the guilt condemnation issue because that's the secret that Satan doesn't want you to know. You don't have to put up with guilt, shame, and condemnation. And it's through the blood of Jesus. You overcome Satan. The very verse in the Revelation that tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren before our God day and night tells us, but they overcome him. It's talking about Satan. They overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So when you go before God and you plead the blood and you ask Jesus Christ to cleanse you and forgive you, you're no more forgiven than the moment you ask for forgiveness. People may not forgive you the rest of their life. People may not forgive you and condemn you as long as they live. That ain't your problem. That's their problem. They're working with the accuser. But I'm telling you, there is no condemnation to them who walk in Jesus Christ and you overcome by the word of your testimony. So stop agreeing with naysayers, slanderers, gossipers, and accusers and start agreeing with the Bible that says the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What will make you whole within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what I want to tell you today. The blood delivers, cleanses, saves, sanctifies, justifies. So today, place everything under the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now that's a good word for somebody. And I want you to receive that word. I know this is a practical word. A lot of people want me to do prophecy. We've got some prophetic messages coming up in the next two weeks on Manifest, so don't miss those. Watch the new offer and get it today right now. My new book titled The Visions contains specific details of visions and revelations involving future, both national and international events, from visions and encounters that I have recorded in my private journal. I've waited for the right prophetic season to disclose these warnings and events. God's Word states that if spiritual watchmen do not warn the people of the danger they see coming, the watchmen will be held accountable for what happens to the people. After experiencing much inner conviction in my soul, I sensed it was the right time to pen what I and others have seen. Much of this book covers warning visions explaining what is coming and how to prepare. I've divided the visions into what was, what is, and what is to come. Here are some of the subjects I will cover in the book. Learn the four different types of spiritual visions. I explain ancient oracles exposing how leaders attempted to see the future. Visions of cities burning, both present and future, including New York City. My father's vision of a planned East Coast nuclear attack. Also, my recent visions concerning cremation ovens. I experienced a vision of a frightening assault on a public school that I want to share with you. I have, for many years, experienced tsunami visions, and I've decided to release that information and include the locations that I have seen in those visions. There is a vision of a nuclear power plant that initiates a stock market crash. There's a vision of empty cities and empty streets that I believe is linked to the recent pandemic and possibly another pandemic coming. The vision of the 10 mile radius bio weapons attack on London, England. And also I've seen in three different visions, a strong earthquake impacting the Midwest, especially the St. Louis area. I also talk about the strange vision of three tornadoes that I believe cost Hillary Clinton her political future. I share a vision revealing future attacks on individual Christians and churches. I also talk about when political leaders and their administrations lose divine favor with God. I have a section where I talk about 2024 and beyond, and I've included what I believe to be an interesting historical parallel about a possible Trump second term, the coming revival through the lens of a camera. One of my favorite chapters that's going to be very helpful to you is this, 10 Rules and Wisdom Principles for Surviving and Thriving at the End. The book also has important instructions for the reader to follow. When you order this new book, I'm also including my two audio CD teaching, The Battle of the Two Marks, which exposes the future mark of the beast and explains the mystery of the seal of God, both which are alluded to in the book of Revelation. Get the new book and the audio CD now for your donation of $35 or more. Ask for offer VS-141. 
You can order at perrystone.org or by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD or mail your order to Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. I hope every prophetic student, intercessor, and those interested to know what is ahead will take time to order this new spiritual resource. I've written this in the fear of the Lord, but I believe it's now the time to release the messages. A remnant is now waking up and preparing. What about you? I found a note from my father that many years ago he had a vision, and this was in the 1990s, of a very tall, strong prince spirit and one that was about half the size of the other one. And the larger one was angry and was railing on the little one and said, why did you let, let Perry get the information on us? And uh, the little one said, I've tried everything to stop him, but I haven't been able to. And the big one said, if you don't stop him, I'll stop him myself. And there were, of course, a lot more details to it. I found those notes a while back. And I want you to understand something that the attacks that Satan is bringing against churches, ministries, the body of Christ are about revelation. Revelation opens the eyes of people. Revelation from the Holy Spirit and the power of God helps people to see through the veil of darkness and the, it, then they can receive deliverance and healing and freedom and restoration and salvation. And so uh, Paul was talked about a thorn in the flesh given to him because of the abundance of revelation. Folks, pray for your pastors, pray for your leaders, pray for the spiritual leaders, and please understand, we're in the last days, and the battle is gonna get crazy. Satan in Revelation 12, it will become the accuser of the brethren before God day and night. Um, and so we need to be in very heavy prayer, and we have prayer teams that, through our ministry and also uh, through uh, of the different ministries here we're associated with. So stay in prayer and don't forget to order the book and the CD while it's available. It's really doing well. Many people are being touched and helped. Go to perrystone.org and also follow us on the Perrystone YouTube channel. And don't forget, start praying. God bless you. Make plans to attend the 2022 International Prophetic Summit, June 23rd through 26th at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. Come hear the latest prophecy updates from Jonathan Kahn, Kurt Landry, Mark Biltz, Bill Cloud, and Perry Stone. This huge event kicks off Thursday night and continues all day Friday and Saturday, concluding in a doubleheader with Bill and Perry on Sunday morning. There is no fee to attend, but you must register online at perrystone.org, where you will also find information on hotels in the area. Seating is limited, so sign up today. Don't miss fresh insights and exciting new prophetic revelation as each speaker proves that we are living in the end of the age and headed toward a date with destiny, including the return of the Messiah. The 2022 Prophetic Summit. Register now.